Hi, everyone. Welcome to join today's session. Hope you will have a great work week in Detroit. Uh, so, today we're going to share some hands on experience on running Cube Scheduler, including configuration, extension, and operation. We hope by the end of this talk, you will get some uh, practical ideas and actionable practices to run your scheduler more efficiently in your production environment. And firstly, let's introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Yuan Chen from Apple Cloud Service. So glad to meet you. And it's cool to also see so many people show up. Hopefully, there are many more people online. Uh, I'm Wei Huang. I'm also from Apple. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the SIG Scheduling. Uh, I'm Ibo. Uh, I work in, as a software engineer in Apple Cloud Services. Uh, this is actually my first KubeCon, so I'm pretty excited. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Wang from IBM Research, and I actively uh, contribute to uh, scheduler plugins and auto scaling. Uh, on the other side, because I'm in research, I also did a lot of research for uh, in resource management for uh, Kubernetes, and I also try to enhance Kubernetes with all uh, for all types of machine learning workload. I'm very looking forward to talking to you in person. Cool. Uh, so this is today's agenda. Firstly, we will give a very high level introduction on the cube scheduling, and then we'll deep dive into each part, configuration, operation, and extension. And in the, in the end, we hope we can have five to 10 minutes for answering questions. All right, the first part about what is scheduling anyways. So when we talk about scheduling, we usually talk about the typical power life cycle, because scheduler is just playing a certain part in the whole life cycle. So it starts with the part creation, usually either by a user directly creating a part or creating a deployment, and the control manager is responsible for spinning up the path. So after that, the job of the control manager is done, then is turn to the scheduler to try to use its knowledge on the whole cluster to find the best node for the path. So right now, it just treat the schedule as a black box. The input is the pending path, and the output is uh, the path associated with the uh, node. And uh, after that, it's kubelet is responsibility. Then the corresponding kubelet will get notified, OK, there's path coming to my node, I, so I should be responsible to bring it up, to spin up the corresponding containers, then the pod gets into a running state. And then after that, optionally, if it's a run to completion pod, then it will run its job, finish the job, and it's done. Then the pod gets into a completed state. But it can be also that the pod is a long running services, then the pod just stay running forever. So this is basically the whole power life cycle. And the scheduler just focused on uh, between the power creation and the power running. So let's zoom into the red rectangle box to look into a little bit into the internal of the scheduler. The first thing to look at the scheduler is what's the input and output. So the input, one type of input is definitely the pending path that the scheduler should be diligent work on to find the best and the file. And the other thing, to make the part placement decision, it should be aware of the up-to-date cluster status, including not only to the running path, the nodes information, uh, storage information, PV, PVCs, et cetera. So in this case, internally scheduling will uh, cache all the information, and so that you can make the right decision for placing the path. This is the first first part. And second part is the, we call it internal queues. So the path comes in, we should find the uh, proper mechanisms to sort them properly, and also have some uh, back off mechanisms so that it's uh, pretty 
fair to schedule both the high priority paths and those or low priority paths. That's the second part for queues. And then the third part is called core scheduling. Then a typical workflow is that a part popped up from the internal queue, then the core scheduling works on it, goes through a series of the uh, actions, then the output comes into two ways. One is, okay, we can't find a node to host the path, so we go to the binding cycle. Binding cycle is nothing but uh, associate, with, associate a node name with the path. So that is one upper. And the other part, part is that, okay, sorry, I cannot find a node to host the path. Then the path goes back to the internal queue and uh, went through some predefined back off timers, then it has another chance to be retried later. So this is basically also pretty high level of the internal of the schedule. Then if you zoom in the uh, core scheduling a little bit, uh, we came up with an extensible framework that we define a series of the extensible extension point and at each phase you can associate with the corresponding logic to overcome a particular scheduling constraint. But by here, I won't go too into two details because later I will slide some detail in each extension point. But here, you just uh, want you to understand that there are two typical or three typical phase in a regular scheduling cycle. One is called the filter. So the filter, the output is that it will give you a yes or no answer. If there, we can find a node, a multiple nodes to host the pod or not. It's a binary uh, result. And after filter, if we can find at least one node, we will go to the score phase. Then the score is to rank the feasible nodes. Then by giving some predefined algorithm and policies, then come up with a final node. We suggested the path to be run on. So this is the happy path. We can't find nodes, but that can be a negative path, right? We cannot find nodes. Then in that case, it goes to the post filter uh, in the red rectangle, go to the post filter phase. Post filter, a typical implementation is called preemption. So preemption efforts is that, okay, I may want to sacrifice some low priority paths to make room for the high priority paths to run. So yeah, that is basically the most critical three phase. By now, I want you to, to get to know, but later I will just go a little dip into that. And uh, another thing I want to mention is that uh, scheduling is not only just a fixed block. It can be very dynamic. So in two ways. One is you can craft different scheduling flavors by a term called profiles. So each file is like a, can be associated with a particular uh, scheduling pattern or flavor, like you want the part to be more impact or be more uh, spread. And each profile is consisted with a lot of plugins. The plugins is like the minimal unit that resolve a particular scheduling domain problem. And then you can just build the profile using the plugins like using Lego blocks. And uh, Ibo will go pretty deep into profile plugins in the next sections about uh, scheduling configuration. We'll hand over to Ibo. Thanks, Wei. So uh, I will be going over. Okay, thank you. So uh, I will be going over the scheduler configuration itself. Um, so you can think of the Kubernetes scheduler configuration um, is, it, you can do that in a declarative format similar to like a pod spec, for example. So you can see here um, that we have like a sample uh, cube scheduler configuration. Um, there it's kind of mostly consists of 
the global configurations, uh, the global parameters. So these are things like, for example, the cube config to use to be used to connect to the API server, or things like their either, uh, leader election configuration, um, and things like you know the pod initial backup seconds and max backup seconds, which I'll go over in a bit. Um, we also have a list of profiles that you can configure, as Wei mentioned earlier, um, that basically can define the exactly uh, exact behavior of this particular scheduler instance. Um, so, and also at the profile level, you can have a per plugin configuration, uh, which you can control, for example, which set of plugins to enable and disable, um, as well as things like, um, uh, like the parameters that you pass into the specific uh, plugin itself. Um, so one thing to note here is that the API version that's currently supported is v1 beta 2, v1 beta 3, and v1, and v1 beta 2 is in the process of being deprecated. So um, at the global kind of parameters level, um, we've got uh, a couple of things to know that you can kind of tune and, um, and, and see how, how it performs. So percentage of node to score is basically a percentage of all the nodes uh, used for the initial search of like feasible nodes. So by default, um, it is doing an adaptive uh, percentage between five and 50%, and this is to kind of make sure that the scheduler is performant enough, especially for large clusters where you may not, not necessarily need to consider all possible nodes at all time. Um, but if you do need to kind of want to do that, you can tune this percentage yourself. Um, so one of the things that my colleague Yuan has recently actually submitted a pull request on GovMerge upstream, which is to be able to configure this at the per profile level and not just at, as a global parameter. Um, the next section here is on leader election, so you can control this to base, basically have your scheduler run in leader election mode. Um, this is to encourage for high availability, um, and the locks here that you can support are um, uh, le leases, endpoints, as well as config maps. Um, for the initial backup seconds and max backup seconds, so these are essentially um, for unscheduled pod. Uh, unschedulable pods case where the pod may go through a sequence of exponential backups. So just is to avoid things like head of the line blocking where you don't want to constantly, constantly trying to reschedule over and over like this unschedulable pods. So at a high level, um, this is like a very simplified view of the scheduler internal queues. Um, so there are three main queues that make up the, the scheduler. So there is the active queues where all the pods will be uh, placed in this queue are kind of ready to be scheduled. So you can think of, uh, you know, at the, every single scheduler interval called the schedule one is gonna pop off that pod from the active queue and tries to find a feasible node for that. And if I'm unable to find a feasible node, then I will be placing that pod into the unschedulable queue. And there will be a bunch of uh, events and triggers that will basically flush those unschedulable queue into either the backup queue or the active queue to be considered for rescheduling. So in the case of the backup queue, um, it's in, essentially this is where it's going through the exponential backup, starting from the initial backup seconds all the way until maximum backup seconds. So for example, you may want to uh, set your max backup seconds to be quite high for like a very large cluster where you want to kind of uh, con con not to like for a pause there, like maybe unschedulable for a long time, you may want to have that go through a high, like a longer backup time so that it doesn't kind of do with headline blocking. Um, so now moving on to like the specific profile configuration. Um, so the profile configuration itself allows for like a, a granular control of the extension points. So those extension points are like QSOR pre filter I'm not gonna go over all of these. Um, there's gonna be a specific section going over each, every single one of the extension point. Um, but basically you can kind of see from an example here that um, I've got a my awesome sort uh, custom plugin that I wanna enable for the QSORT extension point with some parameters like percentage of node reserved or something like a learning strategy, for example, if this uh, plugin is doing some kind of learning uh, placement algorithm. Um, but you can control these parameters for that specific plugin in the plugin config section. Um, and you can also see that I've uh, not only enabled my custom plugin A, uh, I've also enabled this uh, for my custom plugin B with a different weight. So the weight here really allows for favoring uh, plugin score during uh, the, what's called the normalization. So how that works is at the scoring layer, um, is going to go through every single plugin and finding a per plugin uh, score for uh, every single particular node. And then it's gonna kind of create a normalized uh, final score that's basically factoring the weight. So it's gonna take that score and multiply it by the weight and divide it by the weight sum of all the enabled plugins uh, and to find the, the final score for that particular node. 
And basically, the node that's scoring the, that has ended up with the highest score will be chosen as a node for placement of the pod. Um, so starting from v1 beta 3 of the scheduler configuration, um, we have uh, there's an added support called a multipoint um, inside the plugin configuration, which uh, simplifies the enablement and disablement across several extension points. So prior to this, if um, you know I have a plugin that extends up a series of different extension points, then I would have to go through and turn this on for every single extension point, which can be kind of cumbersome. For example, if I just want to enable this across like a bunch of extension points. So let's run through an example here where I've got my default queue stored, which is the default one that ships with the scheduler, but I want to kind of disable it and I want to use my custom queue sort uh, extension. Um, I've also got two default plugins that's shipped, but I kind of want to, for example, disable the plugin uh, one for filter stage and maybe uh, enable my plugin for only the scoring stage of uh, uh, the, the plugin two. But I also, for example, I have, I have two custom plugins with one being, um, both of the plugin being uh, extending, you know, all the filter and scoring stages. So if I were to do this in the prior multi-point uh, uh, approach, then I would have to go in and say, you know, pre-filter enable plugin one, plugin two, filter enable plugin one, plugin two, which is pretty tedious and there's a lot of uh, lines that you have to, of YAML that you have to write. But in this particular case, I can just simply say multipoint, uh, enable my custom plugin one with a scoring weight of three, and, and, and it will be able to enable that for all the extension points. So this would be you know, pre-filter, filter, pre-score, and score. Um, so we've briefly touched upon like multi-profile, but I wanna kind of dive a little bit deeper here. So um, basically a single instance of Cube Scheduler here can run multiple profiles. And under each profile, um, you would define a name for that particular scheduler, as well as um, a set of plugin specific configurations. So this is things like the multipoint for enable one or more plugins or uh, specific plugin arguments. Um, so when you have done that, um, then for your pod to be able to target a specific profile, um, you would set that in the spec scheduler name of the pod spec. And Basically, if you don't do any customization for the cube scheduler, out of the box, you will get a single uh, scheduler profile with the name being default scheduler, and the pod will, uh, by default, set the spec scheduler name to be default scheduler. But in this particular example, um, I've got like two profiles with one default scheduler and one second scheduler with uh, some customizations. And for example, if I want to uh, target my pod for the second scheduler, uh, I would set this in the spec scheduler name. Um, one thing to note here is that all the profiles here um, must use the same plugin uh, for queue sort. This is because the uh, scheduler itself has only one pending pod queue. So um, you must ensure that when you're sc specifying multiple profiles, that the queue sort layer, um, whether you uh, enable a custom uh, sorting algorithm or something, um, that they have to be the same across all the profiles. So uh, the, the, the cube scheduler itself uh, comes, is already like base driven based on plugins. So there's a list of default plugins that ships with the cube scheduler. Um, I don't have the entire list here, um, but there are some notable ones here that really kind of is something that's important to tune as well as something important to, to, to kind of make note of. Um, one of them being the node resources fit plugin um, with a default weight of one and the default uh, scoring strategy being least allocated with a CPU weight and a memory weight of one each. So I will be going over uh, in, a, in the next slide on, uh, in depth about the node resources fit itself. Um, there is also the interpod affinity plugin as well as the node resource balance allocation plugin, which is used for ensuring like nodes, uh, generally you prefer to score nodes with end up with a placement of a balanced a CPU and memory allocation. So let's talk a little bit about bin packing itself. Um, so the default node resources fit um, plugin uses the least allocated strategy. So what this will do is if you have N nodes and you're trying to place pods into them, what it will do is it will always pick the node with the least uh, resources being used. So it's tr attempting to be a more spread strategy where you're kind of think of that as like horizontally placing pod until everything fills up. 
Um, but one thing that you can do, let's say if you prefer to bin pack more aggressively by saying I want to place pods in a way such that I want to fill up one node first before I move on to the next node, um, you can use the most allocated um, strategy here but within your scheduler configuration. So you just set this that the, the scoring strategy type being most allocated under your node resources fit. And in here, what it will do is um, it will basically start packing pods in a way that fills up the first node and then move on to the next node, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, the, and here's the algorithm, which is basically uh, you go uh, request resource, uh, resource requested divided by resource capacity multiplied by the percentage, um, as well as multiplied by the weight that's associated with that particular resource. So you could tune this such, such as like if you want to do you know, higher weight for CPU or lower weight for memory, or maybe a different you know, weight for like a custom resource like a GPU or something like this. You can, you can tune this according to um, you know, how your cluster and your node resource looks like. So another thing that, another strategy that comes with the node resources fit is what's called the request to capacity ratio. So this allows you to have really kind of fine control of the scoring shape by giving kind of the exact mapping of my node utilization to the actual score that I wanna get. So in this particular example, um, I've got my um, you know, scoring strategy to be request to capacity ratio and my shape looks something like if my node's utilization is 0%, then the score is 0. And if my node utilization is 100%, then I want to score a 10, 10 being the max here. So what this will do is you can see it will draw like a linear line from you know, 0 to, 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 to 10, essentially. And basically, if your node percentage lands on one of the dots, it will give you a score according to what the line says. So this can be really useful if you don't uh, necessary. I mean, this is a very simplified example, but if you want to have a more complicated, different shaping example, you could really kind of find your control like your utilization to like your score mapping. So in this particular case, you know, I see that uh, I, I've got like a more like a parabolic kind of shape where, you know, as the percentage goes uh, really high, then my score changes much more, less significant than, you know, at the lower uh, uh, utilization uh, percentage. So I'm gonna do a demo here of the node resources fit here. So um, I'm inside a VM and um, I'm going to be using a kind cluster here to show this. So I've got four nodes here with uh, one control plane node and three worker nodes. So what I'm gonna do here is um, rather than, uh, I'm, I'm gonna show that basically um, how I would configure this by deploying actually a second scheduler into the cluster. And the second scheduler here, um, I've, I've specified my configuration here um, with two profiles. So the first profile here is gonna be a spread scheduler. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn off all the other scoring plugin except for the node resources fit. This is just to really amplify this example here um, of what this uh, of request to capacity ratio um, uh, looks like. And in the plugin config itself, I wanna say, okay, I'm gonna weight CPU and memory being equal. And my request to capacity ratio is gonna say, if I'm at 0% utilization, then I'm gonna give it max score. And if my utilization is 100%, then I'm gonna give it min score. So the spread scheduler really just behaves like the least allocated um, scoring strategy. And then I've got a second uh, profile called the pack scheduler. And what this pack scheduler is gonna do is, it's gonna do the opposite, which is gonna say if my utilization is 0%, then I'm gonna give it a score of zero. And if my utilization is 100%, then I'm gonna give it a score of 10. So this is basically saying I wanna bin pack such that the, mo the nodes with, uh, the, the nodes that's most used will be chosen for, for my placement. So um, we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to be deploying this scheduler. So I've got my second scheduler uh, uh, deployed now. So um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just test this out by um, looking at my, uh, so I'm gonna create a deployment of six replicas. Um, I'm gonna set my scheduler name to target the spread scheduler. So I want to to kind of spread my pods out across the three worker nodes. So I'm going to apply the spread case. Okay. 
So you can see that my, uh, all, all six of my, my replicas are running and uh, they're placed evenly across the three worker nodes. I've got two in each node. So I'm gonna delete this deployment and then I'm going to, to be deploying a second example that's um, targeting the pack scheduler. So it, exactly the same configuration, the only thing is I'm targeting this to a different profile. And I'm going to apply this. And all of them are running and you can see that basically all six pods got placed on that one node. So this is basically, um, we are essentially been packing as much as possible until this node fills up before we move, we move on. So that's all I wanted to show here in the demo. Um, let me jump back to the keynote. So I think next uh, Yuan is going to be talking about the scheduler operation. Do we, do we want to take questions now or take questions at the end? Uh, uh, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions. Maybe you can just take that right now. Yeah. Sure, so the question was, um, did, you, did, did, did we have any specific use cases where you wanted to actually configure these profiles rather than just use the default one? So um, we have some use cases where um, we have particular large clusters where some customers we may want to really bin pack really tight um, because they run a very large scale deployment. And in those cases, um, you know, we do need to help them fine tune because some of the default spread strategy may not be the most efficient at placement. Of pods. Uh, go ahead, yeah. So the short answer is uh, it's up to the cloud vendors to like how to make their control plane more extensible and uh, uh, manipulatable for the for the end user. But in a practical view, is that uh, you can deploy the whole your customer plugins or whatever in outside because you don't have the control on on the control plane, so that. Uh, because you specify a secondary scheduler, so ideally it doesn't conflict with the default scheduler. If you don't use the default scheduler at all, you just use the because you want the control over that. Yeah. Because use it this way, you uh, you have the one hundred percent compatibility with the default scheduler, and you just have the pure add-ons to, to fit your customer needs. I think we should continue yeah. Yeah, to finish it. Then yeah. by the end of the Q&A session, we will have a little time yeah. for questions. Yeah, I, I think we can, is my audio on? Can you hear me well? Okay. So we can take more questions after the talk. Yeah, uh, yeah. just come to, to us. Thanks for Yibo for the great presentation, the demo. I think Yibo has covered everything and did it work for me. Maybe I can just skip my, <laughs> next session but uh, anyway so my next session I'm going to focus more on, on how to operate the scheduler right and uh, in particular share and uh, some the experience and the knowledge with you how to for example build deploy a scheduler and uh, when you run a scheduler definitely the events and the log information very important in particularly and uh, 
if you maintain the scheduler, you will know most of the problem, right? The customer users come to you and they say, oh, why my ports and are not scheduled? Why it's so slow to schedule, right? So how to troubleshoot and some of the typical problems. Then I will also show you some key metrics and some example dashboards and hopefully you will find it helpful. Uh, so I have a, yeah, create some of the examples and we upload it to this in the GitHub repo. So if you go to our presentation and we upload the presentation uh, PDF file, so in this, on these slides and uh, you can click the link if you want to play with it, as long as you have the Go 119 and you can yeah, just download and clone the Kubernetes latest version, you have a local Kubernetes environment, either MidiCube or Kind, yeah, both should work. Then also I have a bunch of the uh, YAML files there, so you, you, you can yeah, play with it and if you are interested. Uh, so, so one thing that I want to mention, right, Ibo and uh, mention a lot, also we and uh, detail and how advanced the schedule to make the decision, right, the different queue and the different plugin, different placement strategy. But uh, if we put it the simplest, uh, we, right, what does a scheduler and, uh, do, right? It's basically just to say to get an un, un, unscheduled port and choose a node and then assign a node name to that port. And that's all, right? You can use very and advanced algorithm or the simplest way you could use a random, right? I just the random choose one if it's working and then just place there. So also, and uh, if you want to run a scheduler from an API server perspective, Schedule is nothing and uh, different from it's another client or another controller, right? As long as you can connect to the Kubernetes API server, you are fine. And you can get the port information, you can update the port. So it's simple like that. Also, you can run and uh, as many schedule as you want, as long as each schedule have a different name, unique name. Uh, you already covered that. So, okay. So go back to this and uh, if we look at the the scheduler, right? And uh, here, I, I, I just want to show you and see, and uh, everyone can play with it and uh, with your local environment, uh, customize it and other things. This is a repo I, I downloaded, right? I simply, you just make a cube scheduler and uh, it will and, uh, generate, okay? So by default, and uh, it will generate uh, this, created this, and uh, binary files here and uh, called a cube schedule, and that's the default name, then you can run it. The interesting thing, another thing is how you want to run the schedule, right? Is the voice still working, right? It's also just the simple and uh, you run this command and the only interesting thing or matter and uh, what matters most or the only parameter basically is you need is specify the scheduler port is a file or configuration file, you borrow the color, right? The simplest one in the configuration file also, there are only one single parameters probably is really matters. Is this in the Kubernetes config, right? Kubernetes config, and uh, I hope you know, right? Specify your, your certificate key, how you connect to API server. If you have that, yeah, that's all. You can just run a scheduler. So option two, of course, in most of the production system will run and we containerize the schedule and run it in uh, ports and uh, uh, containers, but nothing different, right? You create image and uh, in a command line, you just start it. So if we go back to and my demo and here, right, my environment and here, so, so you will see, yeah, I, I also have the, script there. You can see here, yeah, just to run this and the schedule I just built and specify the configuration file. Also the configuration file and now you've already covered it and I gave you a simple example set. I created two basically profile. One is I call it a default one, nothing plug in. I didn't customize anything. Another one I call it the best fit. You both mentioned the, 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 the curve, scoring curve here and I use the Default, the uh, in tree already upstream one, but it's not a default. Default called the least allocated. You can think it's a worst fit, right? Try to find the most idle nodes. Most allocated one means I will best fit. Try to find the most allocated one is like being packing. Yeah, 
something like this. Yeah, other parameters the ball covered, I, I just specified there. Then, yeah, you, you just write and uh, yeah, this kind. Of, you, if you see all this information, yeah, it's working, right? You see it is. So it's just the simple like that, then you can debug and try and if you want to play with it and test with it. Okay, so go back to my talk here. Yeah, I already covered this. So as I mentioned, so firstly, of course, if you didn't start it successfully, most is right, make sure your path is correct, and you have the right config. Also, you, you should config R back and other, make sure your schedule can get the information, can also update the loads. But one tip I want to show here is a, a relative new and a feature. I don't know when it's available in this. So if you want to debug and uh, your configuration other thing, you can specify when you run a command called write config2 with this and uh, command line flag. So it will generate basically and uh, the configuration files for you and uh, what you are running. So for example here, okay. So now of course I, I really run the, the scheduler and uh, but this one, if I use this, I have another one, I call it write config. The only difference here, I want to start the ske scheduler and the actual scheduler. Instead, just generate this and the profile configuration file. So if you use this one, of course you can play and then later we, I have all this script there. Okay, it's basically we generate and the, the scheduler files for you and uh, this one. So if you check this and uh, it's a known file and a large file, right? It it's already populated all this and the default and the configuration plugin information. So then you can see is anything right or wrong, right? Your configuration and this default value, you can see our lead election is true or false. So this will be very useful for you to debug and if your configuration or your schedule and didn't and start, okay? Then switch back. Okay, so once you started, and uh, as I mentioned, so most important thing, and uh, I, I think is you should understand, uh, check or look at the scheduler log file. So typically, and uh, there are all different ways you can specify config it, and uh, early version you can specify in a uh, log file and just on the command and the flag. Now I think there are different uh, log and utility and can config it. So in the scheduler file, I would see, yeah, we and uh, give a, brief and the introduction, the, the life cycle. So most important information here we see, neither a, a port is scheduled successfully or a schedule not in the scheduler. You, you, you need to check these key events in the log file. One is when a port is submitted, you will see an add event for this unscheduled port. Basically is right added to the scheduled queue. Then it have to wait in the queue until the schedule pick it up so once it's turned to be scheduled, you will see this information, this keyword, attempting to schedule this port. This is the time the schedule will run the plugin, try to find a node fit to it, right? If it, it's successfully scheduled, you will see this message, successfully bound this port to a node, you will see the node name. Then you will see delete the uh, unscheduled port, right, add the scheduled port. On the other hand, if a scheduler and is not is a port, if a port is not a scheduler, most important thing information and uh, in addition to the queue and other events information, you will see this and not fit. Also, each node, right? And what's the reason that caused the scheduler? Uh, this scheduled port scheduling field, the reason, right? The 72 ports didn't match other information. That's how you can debug and uh, your information, why it's successfully and uh, or not. So typically, and there are tons of reasons, right? And uh, a, a port is not scheduled successfully. But I would like to summarize and uh, yeah, three high level and categories. And uh, that's what and, uh, we have seen and uh, in production or in practice. One is, yeah, could be a lot of misconfiguration, in particular related to the 
uh, storage persistent volume or persistent volume claim, right? It's not found other things. So that's one thing. In particular, I think different customers or cl cloud providers have different storage solutions. So that is something, and uh, you should, and uh, yeah, definitely check. Be careful. Another, the second one, and uh, of course, is if the scheduler and uh, is not able to find a uh, feasible nodes to fit this and the ports, right? And uh, then that's also very typical and we have seen and uh, depending on the availability, allocated resources, also the physical and the capacity we find it. The last one is the, yeah, so the a port can specify a lot of the constraints, additional constraints, right? The port affinity, node affinity, node select. If it's soft constraint, it's preference, it's okay, but if it's hard constraints, then you will see, and maybe even you have nodes available, right? Resource available in general, but it cannot and the scheduler ports. So now, and uh, yeah, if we look at the log here, and I, I will quickly, yeah, just show and uh, some examples as well. And uh, yeah, uh, so again, I, I'm going to start with scheduler, right? So now, if I, I have a port, very simple ports here, right? And uh, like, I, yeah, it's nothing specify uh, five CPU and uh, I use this profile name. You remember our scheduler, right? We have the, yeah, uh, we specify, we create two profile, right? You can use any one to do it. Yeah, it's a little bit stolen at all. Okay. What's going on? Oh, I have this notch port and uh, I run early and. Otherwise, it can only run one port. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, right, you will see and uh, the, the, the information about the ports, right, and uh, basically try to uh, attempting to schedule it, attempting bind it, then successfully bound the ports to node, then add the scheduled event, delete the scheduled event, and uh, this. But if I run a uh, Another and a large ports, right? I have a large ports with two CPU because my nodes, if you look at, yeah, so so far it's already used 60%, yeah, almost 1.2 CPU, yeah, and this node, and if you check the allocatable resources is two CPU. So now it's only have this and uh, less than 0.8 CPU available. So now I purposely create a large port request, uh, yeah, this unschedulable one. I request two CPU, right? It should not be able to schedule, right? Yeah, you see it's pending, right? Here and also, as you can see this message as I just showed, right? One means they are one node because I, 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 I'm using a media cube and the class is only a one node. So it means that one node insufficient CPU. So anyway, that's the most, uh, if you want to check and look into the reason why uh, ports is not scheduled and uh, you search the node, just look at this, unable to schedule it, right? And then look at the reason why the ports not scheduled. Okay, then that's switch back. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, due to the time, this is a little bit uh, uh, complicated in other case I didn't show, but this is the typical message. You can check and the misconfiguration, position the volume, as I mentioned, also the tent and the affinity. Okay, the second one is, uh, okay, maybe the, the port is scheduled, but it's too slow, right? That's also, and uh, yeah, as we, we are maintaining and uh, yeah, the Kubernetes and a lot of times customers, oh, it's way too slow to schedule a port. So here I, I also want to mention and uh, yeah, some of the common the cases or, or tricky cases. The first one is, you know, the, the scheduler need to talk to API server, maybe even talk to some of the admission controller, 
because it need to update the ports. So it need the networking collection and make sure the network and the latency is uh, okay. Otherwise, a lot of times we also notice that because of the network and latency issue. So the schedule to make a good decision and the right decision and a quick decision, but unfortunately, and it cannot update the ports and the status then this will slow down the entire pipeline and finally slow down the, uh, the scheduler, port the scheduler, increase the latency. So normally if you check the log, you will see some, yeah, like the uh, collection, timeout, other information, like error updating this and the ports, that's one thing. The second thing, yeah, Ibo and uh, mentioned, it's very important is this. So there are two parameters called a back off, right? If a scheduler the first time was not scheduled successfully, it will be put into the unscheduled queue, then to the back off queue, then wait for its back off time, right? Expire, then it's moved back to the active queue to get another chance to be scheduled. But it's uh, also, I think, important, also sometimes tricky to set these parameters. And uh, the default one is uh, one second for the initial back off seconds. And, uh, 10 times for the maximum one. So it's exponentially increased. So it's like a three times it will increase to 10 seconds. Only wait in the back of queue for 10 seconds. Use this and the default one, I would say it's quite good, right? If you want the more the responsiveness, right? Because the cluster status could be changed. So far, the cluster didn't have the five minutes ago, one second ago, and uh, didn't have the resources, but uh, maybe just 10 seconds later, some ports and uh, finished, it can schedule. But another thing that we have to be careful is if you set too small, even use the default one we noticed, it could in large clusters and with thousands of nodes or 10,000 of the ports, you have different priority of the clusters. It could cause some of the head of nine blocking issue. What's, what? what what caused that is because your highest priority ports, for example, highest priority ports, and didn't find a sufficient and a resource to run, it put back to the back off queue. But uh, it's back off and uh, just wait for a few seconds, then come back to the active queue because the default queue and the ranking or sorting is based on priority, right? If you have a large number of these unscheduled higher priority and uh, ports, they are unschedulable, misconfigure other thing. Then we just keep back to the active queue, rescheduling too frequently, then they can cause other no priority ports, right? Blocked and cannot be scheduled. So this is uh, something and uh, you have to make the trade off, right? Responsibilities and also make sure the fairness and the other thing. So maybe I can quickly and uh, show example here, this percentage of nodes the effect, hopefully we can, let me see now what's the default configuration. I started. Okay, so now is the default one I, I just show here. You don't need to specify this default. Initial is one second, maximum is 10 seconds, means the unscheduled only wait for the, uh, in the back of queue for 10 seconds. So now one reason, yeah, I, I start two ports early because this large CPU not just CPU one is pending and uh, because it didn't get enough resource. But uh, what about if I delete it and uh, delete it uh, this pause, right? Okay, I can just call it pause. Okay, let's see and uh, I should restart it and, uh, but let's see how quickly and it's get. I don't know if this is the large CPU ports or unscheduled one. Uh, okay, maybe let me start it from beginning. Okay, that's 1.2, okay. So I start a small one. It should run it, right? Now I start, I'm starting this large one it's pending. Okay, now I delete this small one. Okay, so you can see this one quickly, yeah, even less than 17 
seconds because the back of time is 10, okay? Now what's happened, and uh, if we change this to, let me just give a 60 seconds, okay? Maximum 60 seconds, and the initial 60 seconds, and the maximum also 60 seconds. I will restart the schedule because I changed the configuration file, I have to restart it, okay? Let's see what happened. We started a small one, right? It should run. Okay, now we start this notch one. It should append it. Okay, now we delete this small one. You see, it, it, it's still pending. Of course, we don't need to wait, but uh, we can come back to check, but uh, it's already, it have to wait, to, has to wait and for at least uh, 60 seconds, right? So hopefully, yeah, you, you, you get this information. So this is some parameters we, we, we find and we found in our practice, yeah, it can be useful. So last one, yeah, so I want to mention is this, uh, Percentage of those two score, yeah. Yibo also already covered that. Uh, this is important, and uh, I want to emphasize it again. Is is a uh, balance basically your schedule, scheduling quality and the schedule performance, right? So you don't you can imagine you can have a fastest uh, and the schedule, the quickest the schedule, just randomly choose one, right? And then the quality could be poor, and you may not find the best nodes, but it's definitely is the fastest one. So the Kubernetes have this percentage of those to score, and uh, you can specify it. By default, it's zero, they use a uh, adaptive and the formula. So it's 50, 50 minus the class size divided by 125. So here is examples, and if you specify 60 and uh, percent, then 200, uh, 50 nodes means 250 times 60 and you get the 150 nodes. So means the scheduler will just uh, scan the all this cluster nodes until it finds the 150 feasible nodes, right? For this example, you can see here and that's from some logs and I, 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 I run in the offline. So it's evaluate a total of 232 nodes then finally find this and 150 and uh, yeah, port. But if you don't specify in the, the parameter, use the default one, the default use this formula, the percentage is 28%. 28% of the 250 nodes is less than 100. So the current implementation, the default minimum and the feasible nodes is 100. So because it's less than two, uh, 100. So you can see here, it search 172 nodes until it found 100 feasible nodes. I just want to mention the use cases for this one is, for example, for batch workload, you have some Spark job with thousands of ports. You may don't care about where it's get wrong, right? You just uh, maybe said, oh, I use a small percentage. Quickly, I want, right, improve the throughput. You just find the nodes for me. But for your long running service, you may want to make sure all these soft constraints, affinity rule, yeah, node affinity, anti-affinity rule can be met then you may want to them and uh, yeah, search, scan a large number of the nodes. Recently, we had already found that if this number used the default one, maybe your port interfinity rule cannot be met. Why? Because this node get one set of feasible nodes. Another port get another one. Basically, they are disjoint set of uh, nodes. Even the entire cluster, you can find the nodes co-located these two ports to minimize your networking connection or latency. But because each individually get two disjoint nodes pool, so you cannot find them. So that's something and uh, I, I think would be very interesting and uh, to look at and it could be a useful thing. So last uh, and uh, is about metrics. So finally, of course, we, you can check the log and there are some parameters and Yibo and I already discussed is a tons of the scheduling and the schedule related metrics uh, you can check. So here, and I put three key ca uh, the categories of the metrics you may find useful and uh, when you operate or run a schedule, one is performance related one. 
So there are a bunch of the metrics. High level is uh, you can get uh, end to end from a submission port submission until it's successfully uh, uh, scheduled one. So even multiple cycles, if it's uh, one go to go through three cycles get scheduled. So this is the total end to end time. You can also get a single scheduled cycles time. You also can have the each plugin and we mentioned right like the filter scoring even different the preemption the performance the second category is you can get the schedule different results said okay how many get scheduled how many and unschedulable also in the queue you can get the how many ports so far in the active queue in unscheduled queue or in the back of queue finally and the preemption is important right if your high priority ports uh, not scheduled and uh, the scheduler try to evict other ports so you can get a bunch of the preemption information total preemption attempts right if this ratio is too high and probably means your capacity might be in a trouble right or how how many ports actually and uh, are evicted or preempted so you can check this yeah I have the link here you can check this and uh, uh, the the metrics files uh, in the scheduler package they list all this metrics as well as the descriptions so here i want to go to the detail then of course you can create the grafana dashboard can monitoring the all this information yeah as i said the latency information the ports information and the preemption information all kinds of information that definitely will be a great tool and to get the information about the performance about the uh, overall status of the schedule so okay, I think that's all I have, and uh, I probably don't have time to take any questions, but uh, we hopefully can answer something and uh, some question at the end of the talk, or you can talk, come to us to ask any questions. Okay, we. All right. <sighs> Thanks, Yuan and Yibo, for the operation and the configuration part. So next part is about scheduler <coughs> extension. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Scheduler does provide a lot of entry functionality and provides the flexibility for you to config to behave it differently, but it's also very possible you still miss the fundamental functionality you want to fit your custom workloads. So what should you do? Is there any way to push the boundary of the default scheduler? The answer is yes. So there's a couple of extension ways to extend the kube scheduler, just like the principle of the overall Kubernetes platform. So the first one is called scheduler extender. This is the first mechanism we introduced, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, so basically, extender is an external HTTP webhook. You can just associate with particular phase of a scheduling cycle. Uh, but there's a two problem. One is it only provides a pretty limited phase for you to hook on. Uh, I think I rem if I remember correctly, right now you only can hook into filter, score, and the preemption. And the second problem is that this mechanism, this design is based on, well, you have to involve the network cost to exchange data between your webhook and the cost scheduler. And also the Marshall and the demarshal cost cannot be uh, avoided. So because of these two issues right now, we don't quite recommend it to use it in a large cluster. So we do get some reports that the extender can slow down the overall scheduling throughput. So the second way, schedule plugin is the most recommended way to extend the cube scheduling right now. And uh, yeah, the latest stats were basically based on this. So it resolved the two problems I mentioned in Extender. First one is it provides a bunch of extensible points for you to extend. And basically at every single place you can think of to extend, basically there's an extension point for you to use. And second one is that we no longer to use the HTTP or RPC connection between your extension and the cost schedule. Instead, we provide a language-specific interface. So basically, you have to implement that in interface, then recompile the extra plugins atop 
the default scheduler. So basically, you have the 100% compatibility and just have the net benefits of the plugins you're developing. And also, the third way, uh, because Kubernetes doesn't have hidden API, what the Kube scheduler can build, you can also build the same thing from sort of scratch. You own the, in that way, you own the everything. You own the queues, you own the cache, you own the everything, and have to implement all the scheduling uh, constraint primitive in the, in the part and everything. So, but yeah, you, you own it. So this talk will basically focus on the second extension. Oops. Give me a second. Oh, anyway. Okay, if you look at the typical scheduling cycle, uh, it first starts with the so-called QSOD interface. QSOD is the interface between your starts, pop up the pod, and gets started with scheduling a pod. So the QSOD is, uh, provides a, a stateless function interface, just give you two paths, and you tell me which pod is, should be prioritized over the other. Then, so that with this function, Default scheduler can know how to sort all the paths into its internal queues. And then, in terms of implementation, right now the default scheduler QSOT plugin just look at the priority value that you set associated with the priority class. Then it can prioritize more high priority paths over the others. But it doesn't prevent you to implement your own logic, like, uh, co-scheduling plugin in the community just to prefer uh, sort the paths which uh, belongs to the same part group over the other so that they can schedule a group of paths back to back so that you can get more chance to schedule a group of paths all together. So this is the QSAT. And after QSAT, you should have a very uh, high chance to pop up the path with, which you think is more important right immediately to get started scheduling. So next phase is called pre-filter. Pre-filter, as the name suggests, uh, is the pre-step before filter. And there are several uh, use cases for pre-filter. The first one is simply, simple. It's just you tell me whether the path should be in a pretty lightweight cost to tell me that we should continue the scheduling or not. So if the path, like, uh, we can in a very early phase to determine that the path shouldn't continue, then we just stop here. So return as early as you can. Uh, and the other use case is that we promise a scheduling cycle related data structure for your pro to promise your specific data structure so you can use later on. Uh, for example, uh, for some complicated scheduling requirements like pod topology spread and the pod affinity, it needs to look at the pod distribution across the cluster. So in this case, later on, the filter interface doesn't quite fit because it doesn't know the entire cluster's uh, pod distribution. So usually, uh, best practice is that you pre-calculate sort of uh, predefined that structure and for the functionality you want to schedule later on, then the data structure the value will be passed down in the same schedule cycle. So you can find the similar implementation in part of topology spread and part affinity. So this is for pre-filter. And another thing I want to uh, also mention is that uh, in the latest Kubernetes uh, offering, we provide a hook called pre-filter result. So in the before, it, it doesn't exist. So basically, it can give you the knob to return a very smaller list of nodes so that the later on scheduling will just do the scheduling logic amount of nodes you provide. So it's pretty useful in terms like you schedule a daemon side path so that you just, because daemon side is just 
you singularly schedule the part onto the single node, so you don't need to search the whole cluster. So you, but you can have some similar innovative idea in your pre-filter implementation. So next, filter. Filter is just give you the part and give you a node, and you tell me whether the node fits the part or not. And uh, uh, yeah, you can be using the pre-calculated uh, information that plumbed into the cycle state, and also you can, if the scheduling logic is pretty simple, you just uh, implement the, the logic without, without the help of the cycle state. And the next, after filter, we should come up with the output of a bunch of candidate nodes, and among the candidate nodes, what we should do is we uh, score them, rank them, to come up with a final winner node for the part that they bind to. So in this phase, pre-score is similar like, pre-score to score is similar like pre-filter to filter. It's just that in this phase, we don't need to provide a, a yes or no answer because when it comes to pre-score, the node we provide here in the node uh, list are all feasible nodes. So in this, this case, so the most uh, now, practical usage is to, again, pre-prompt some calculation so that you can use later in the score phase. And score phase, along with the, uh, we call it the normalized score, is to come up with the final score by given logic. And then the score will be accumulated, and then finally we come up with the final score, so we pick up the highest score for the, for the part that the bind to. Uh, yeah, that's for score. So next, usually after score, actually we can just say, okay, we are all done. We can enter the binding phase, but hold on a little bit. So there's a two more phases we provided for you to do some extra uh, enhancement or accuracy control. The first one is called reserve. So if you take a step, step back, so what's the source of choose of path scheduling? And what's the source of choose of path state? The source of choose is that only the path get persistent into ethicity, we can think, okay, the path is really running there and uh, occupying the resources, right? That means by the end of the score, the path hasn't been bonded yet, it can fail, or it can success. So in this phase, to prevent, to temporarily reserve the resources, but we don't know yet whether it's finally persistent or not, we should provide a reserve phase for you to reserve the specific chunk of resources temporarily. We hope in Happy Pass that later on the banding will become pretty fast and then we just deduplicate the the reserve the resources. Or if some unexpected failure happens after the wars, we just roll back the changes we reserved right now in the in the in the pattern. This pattern is pretty pretty important because in uh, declarative patterns, if we just look at the declarative patterns, the, there will be a lag, right? between the part gets scheduled internally to the phase that the part get persistently. So there is the, is the gap. So we want to, during that gap, we still want to schedule in work close accurately. So that is why we provide the reserve uh, phase that is based on the, uh, this pattern, okay? And the permit is also for the same purpose but it's usually a little differently. So basically, permit, if you look at the interface, uh, it returns a duration. That means in this phase, we semi-approve a part of scheduling, but return with a timeout, meaning by default is, by the end of this timeout, if nobody tells me I should fully approve this part or not, I will reject it. But within the timeout, usually, a typical use case is co-scheduling or gang scheduling. So the sibling path of uh, 
precedent pass, we are tell the scheduler, okay, here we come, and we have reached the quorum, finally, and then all the sibling paths should be approved within the timeout. So that's a very typical use case for, for, for permit use case, uh, for permit extension point. But the default entry plugin doesn't use this permit interface yet. All right, after permit, uh, we enter the other cycle called binding. Binding is pretty straightforward. It's just for performance uh, consideration, we put it into another go routine. That means by the end of the scheduling cycle, by the end of the permit, the schedule will just jump right into the another cycle to schedule the next path. And then, meanwhile, in another concurrent go routine, it starts the binding. So binding includes three parts, pre-bind, so you can do some final check on whether the path uh, can be uh, bind, bind. So typical use case is volume binding. It does find some final check on the PBPVC association. And after pre-bind, it's the bind. Bind, it does nothing but bind the node to the path. So uh, basically, you don't need to implement your own bind, bind implementation. And after bind is post bind. Post bind is usually for post processing or logging for some information, uh, which is maybe useful for your for your scenario. So this is basically the happy path of how schedule internally expose the extension point for you to hook up to schedule a part. But that can be a negative path is that again, what if no node? can fit the path. So there's another red candle in the app is the code post filter. So post filter, the intention for you to implement is that you uh, do some logic like preemption to evaluate whether you have some alternatives to make the path schedulable. Like in the default preemption, it tries to sacrifice some low priority to make room for the high priority. But your implementation can be pre quite innovative. You can just invent what kind of your logic can fit your business need. Like in some, if I remember correctly, some community plugins needs to depend on some customer resource objects. So their logic is pretty uh, customized, so they have to uh, reinvent the preemption logic in the post filter, so you can implement your own. So this is the pretty much the uh, overall of each, what each extension point is, and each has a, gain a large adoption in the industry, like IBM and the Red Hat has built in some plugins into their like OpenShift offerings. So next, uh, Chen from IBM will give us some practical examples of how they use the scheduling framework to build some commercial plugins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank, you. thank you, Wei, and uh, for the nice uh, introduction of all the extension points and plugins. And uh, thank you all for still staying with us. And uh, I know you must all be hungry, but I will be quick. Uh, so I will introduce some use cases of using scheduler plugins to uh, customize our own scheduler for different um, um, types of workload for different clusters. And then uh, I will also give a short tutorial on how you can start writing your own scheduler plugin for your particular use case. So um, the first use case we work on in IBM together with PayPal is the load aware scheduler plugins. So the default Kubernetes scheduler only considered the uh, request and limit, uh, request values of the pod to uh, place the pod on the node. And then uh, w what it ends up with is usually your uh, developers are over allocating resources. They specify very high uh, resource for the request values. And then uh, the 
from the trace I show in the uh, bottom right, and then this is the real Google trace, and it says the request value usually set by developers as much larger than the usage. And then what it end up with is you significantly over provisioning resources for your, all your pods in the cluster, and your cluster would be uh, very uh, low utilized, and then you cannot schedule more pods. That's why we come up with this load aware scheduler plugins, and then we want to schedule pods based on the actual usage on the node, but not the allocations of resources on the node. So there's three different plugins in this um, series, and then uh, I will introduce two here. Uh, for example, the first one, target load plugin plugin. This is a plugin we collaborate with the uh, with PayPal, and it, it's a very simple plugin. Uh, uh, what it does is it um, allow you to try to maintain a certain percentage of utilization for all nodes in your cluster. And then the benefit of it is uh, you, you, you make sure all your nodes in the cluster achieve a certain utilization. Uh, it's not underutilized. Uh, again, and if you keep the margin with one uh, minus X percent, then you still have a margin, safe margin for you uh, for the bursty workload. And then so you get a nice balance between both the utilization and your uh, performance of the workload. And the second one is, uh, this is a particular IBM cluster use case. We noticed that uh, some pods have a very high variations on uh, utilizations. And then if we place those pods together on a particular node, then what happened is uh, in the node, probably on average you will have a very low utilization, but at certain period, because the variation is so high, then uh, you would have birthday workload, all the performance would get done, and then you would end up with out of memory evictions of those parts, and you lose the high availability and performance. So what we were doing is we were trying to balance the risk of having part evictions or performance issues by scheduling parts considering both the average utilization on the node and the variations of the uh, load on the node. And then what it does is actually to maintain a constant value for both the node average utilization and uh, standard deviation, the plus of the, the sum of those. So uh, another use case we already introduced a lot is we, we will have a lot of like machine learning jobs, training jobs, spark jobs that you want to schedule a group of paths all together, uh, make sure they're running at the same time. And we already introduced all of those uh, uh, plugin extension point and co-scheduler co is the uh, scheduler that utilizes those extension point to make sure you have a certain number or ratio of uh, uh, paths, group of paths running together. And then you may check more details on this and it's widely used for Spark jobs and TensorFlow training jobs. So next, I will uh, give a very simple tutorial in just four steps, and then let's go through it. Uh, you can scan the barcode to get the full tutorial uh, if you want to try it your yourself. So usually, uh, the first step you want to start developing your own scheduler plugin is uh, go, go to the scheduler plugin repo, clone the repo, and then create a package for your own scheduler. Let's take the scoring plugin, for example. Here, uh, uh, the, the first thing you want to do is to define the, uh, the plugin uh, struct. Like here, we define the score by label, and then this in this example, we just implement a simple scoring plugin that takes the label's scoring value as the score uh, for scheduling, and then we give it a name, score by label, and then uh, you, uh, you also want to define the name function to return the name as uh, part of the necessary function uh, defined by the plugin framework, and the. Next, the, the, the only thing, the most important thing you want to do is you want to write your own uh, score function. And in this score function, we implement some simple logics like reading the node labels, get the node label uh, value as the score for your node. And then, uh, for example, if your, the scores you derived 
for scoring the nodes is not within zero to 100. You can also use the score extension interface and implement the normalized score function to normalize all your scores between zero to 100. So next, you usually when you want to develop some algorithms, you want to take some input arguments to configure your score uh, plugins. Uh, and then the way to do that is to simply add, uh, uh, for example, plugin name plus args uh, in the APIs, the, uh, in those folders, like uh, either v1 beta 2 or v1 beta 3, right? And then uh, this uh, score, uh, l l let's take a look at the score by label uh, args struct, for example. And here we want the user to be able to configure their own uh, label keys. Uh, that's why we put the label key as a string here. And then you can also uh, add functions to set the default value for your uh, input if it's missing. So lastly, uh, uh, as uh, Yubo already uh, mentioned, we can run uh, the, the, your scheduler plugins as a secondary scheduler for uh, certain, uh, certain types of workload in your cluster. And then the only thing you need to configure is the uh, cube scheduler configuration profile. And then here, uh, because we want to test the score by label plugin, we just enable it and disable all other plugins. And then um, the, the way the workload specify the secondary scheduler is by the scheduler name. And then here we give the name of the uh, scheduler as the score by label, and then we specify the scheduler name for the path. Next, let's um, try to deploy. So here we are in a cluster with three nodes. Uh, let's remember the node IPs with 232, 243, 253. And then we, uh, we don't have any uh, workload right now. And then the first thing we want to set up is uh, to test the score by label plugin is to label the node with a certain score. The key is score by label. And 232, two, we label it with 10. 243, we label it with 5. And uh, 253, we label it with 1. And then now uh, the node 232 has the highest score. And we double check if the label is already there. We can now try to deploy the score by label scheduler um, using a simple deployment, getting the image already built with, together with all the RBAC rules of, available also in the scheduler plugins repo. And uh, we mount the, the, the scheduler configuration uh, to the part so it take, uh, as the uh, Kubernetes config.yaml. And we go ahead and deploy uh, the, the score by label scheduler as the secondary scheduler. Now it's running. What we do next is uh, we want to go ahead to stream the, 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 the logs in another window and then let's take a look at the testing workload, which is a test part. Uh, it's used the score by label scheduler. And we go ahead and create the part. Now you can see it's um, actually the score by label plugin is already running. Uh, the logs shows it uh, get all the scores from different nodes. And then the highest score is the 253. Uh, with the score of 10. What it shows is it attempts to bend the part to the node down to three, uh, 232. And then it finished the binding for the part on that node. 
and we can double check if the uh, the party successfully bind uh, using the events. Yeah, it's I say the party is already started, and it's uh, successfully assigned to uh, two three two, and those are very useful techniques introduced by um, by Wei and Yuan for debugging. So then, let's uh, change the 253 node with a score uh, label of, of 100. Now, uh, 253 becomes the highest scored node. And let's try to deploy the workload again and see where it is scheduled. We first I delete the part and create it again. Skip a little bit because Okay, we'll create it again, and this time, what it happened is um, it tried to add the event for bending, um, and it attempting to bind the pod to two five three. No surprise, right? <laughs> okay, we double check the events, and we have more events that it says. Um, successfully bind the power to 253. And uh, please follow the tutorial on this and uh, uh, I will hand it back to, to Yuan. Yeah. All right. I think this is pretty much for today's session and uh, here are some references. And also on Friday, there's a SIG scheduling deep dive. So that talk will basically talk about some latest updates, both on the schedule itself and some sub project of the SIG scheduling. So yeah, we can have a few minutes to ask questions. Yeah. So the question was whether we have plans to move some out of tree plugins to the in tree to the core. Uh, so it quite depends on a few factors, like how the plugin itself is mature and how it's widely needed by the by the community. And the, the last piece is the API compatibility, whether it needs to introduce a new like high level pod API. So I would say it's possible, but it needs to be worked on case by case. There's no general principle that says, okay, you check mark this, 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 and you can push up to the, to the option. But the good thing is that it's totally compatible. So maybe you just have some, spend some extra efforts to, to just recompile that packet into that. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so I have a question related to performance. Uh -huh. So you have a fairly large cluster of a couple of thousand nodes. Are there optimizations around which subset of nodes the scheduler attempts to schedule the performance? Uh -huh. So if I answer the question was about the performance like uh, maybe in the first round of the scheduling for, for the part one is evaluating the f like part zero to 500, and the, for the next one is evaluate another round of uh, pass. Uh, sorry, nails. Is that your question? Yes. Say that you have, say you have thousand nodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Evaluate all of those thousand nodes to see if you can potentially schedule each of them. Mm -hmm. Potentially take a long time if you have a lot of nodes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think you are recently have the use case in your field. Want to yeah, talk about that? Yeah, we can talk offline just <laughs> the right time for the launch. Yeah. Again, thanks everyone. I've been coming to our session, particularly you staying and until the end of the session. <laughs> really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you again. So yeah, yeah we'll be around. Any so if you want to discuss, we'll be around.